So he's at Ralph's at 3 a.m. in a bathrobe with sunglasses, and he pays for a carton of milk with a check. What are three things every great story has? Well, I think I'm going to be a little bit obvious here, but I think a great opening, uh, you need a hook. Especially nowadays that uh, people are so distracted and there's so much to read and watch. And so a great hook, uh, a great opening that um, offers a question, intrigue. So I would say that. Of course, if I say a great opening, I have to say a great ending. And usually I'd say when I write, that's, those are the two things I think of first. I need to know where I'm starting off from and I need to know where I need to get to. And the beauty or the challenge is, okay, how do I get from point A to point B? Uh, but I'm going to say the third element is a, a great character or characters. Uh, I think one of the most difficult things, things to do is to find characters that feel real or possible and not just ideas, but that feel like people. And that's why the temptation is always to steal from someone you know. And what I mean is, think of people in your life. And you know, and you, I, you never, I personally, I, I don't ever do just one person. I don't, I'm not trying to portray a single individual. I'm taking different elements. It's a composite of different people. Um, with character, I would say though, there has to be an emotional connection. And with this, I mean, it's very easy to have ideas and then apply them. And the risk with ideas is that you're not connected to them. They just sound great, they sound original. But if there's no emotional connection to you, you can sense it. You, you feel it's cold, right? It's, it's too rational. So with character, you, I try to find that emotional connection. Why do I relate to this trait? Why are there certain quality, right? Um, why do I want to keep seeing this? Why do I want, I want to write about this? So I'd say a great beginning, a great ending, and at least one singular memorable character. Can you give me an example of a character, a uh, film or television, that definitely seems real? You could see them once the movie ends, they're still living their life somewhere. And then the opposite one that maybe it was all hype, but really it felt one-dimensional. Um, well, I mean, the, this is the, 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 first, the first character, and I use this in class because the way it's written, it's, it's just, I'd say memorable is the word. So uh, with the Big Lebowski, the way, it, the, way he's the character is introduced in the script, the way it's written and the way we see it on screen, it's just that we know that guy, right? I don't know him, I mean, I don't know him exactly like that, but that, that guy exists and he's so LA, he's so Venice to be specific, you know? And I don't, we don't know how he makes a living and he's funny and he's high all the time. And he's, by the way, so he's at Ralph's at, 3 a.m. in a bathrobe with sunglasses, and he <laughs> pays for a carton of milk with a check, right? So it's like, who is this guy? I know him. He's just by looking at, at him, I'm laughing. And that's because I recognize that character. Uh, and he's memorable. So, you know, the Coen brothers are so good at that. Um, but if we take the graduate, Benjamin in the graduate, for example, a totally different character, more grounded. I, you know, I recognize that guy as well. You know, I'm sorry I'm just mentioning male characters. I'm sure I can find female ones too. But what I'm saying is those are people I can relate to. And if I can relate to them, it's because they're specific enough. You know, and you can come from a totally different, that's the beauty of, of, of art. You come from a different culture, a different background, and even different um, gender, and you connect. Because, you know, there's something about the human experience that you see there. Um, I don't know if I can, I remember the quote, but, uh, you know, David Lynch, who I was listening to on a podcast yesterday, said, um, find the thing that by knowing it, you know all there is to be known. And what that basically means is if you capture a little thing that's real, you're capturing truth in general and people connect to that. That sounds very abstract, but what it means is the more specific you are with your characters, 
the more, you know, with what they like, what they don't like, what they do, how they like their coffee, you know. And I tell students this all the time, ask as many questions as possible. Try to, you know, try to enjoy the process of getting to know your characters as if you were um, knowing someone you just met. And then the opposite, a character or characters that there was a lot of hype around the film or, or the television show, but they fell flat to you. That's a tricky one because uh, I, you know, I have to criticize someone's um, work. I, you know, off the top of my head, I, I don't know. I can usually, this is the thing, big franchises don't have great characters because it doesn't matter, uh, you know, and I, I don't want to be cheap and, and crit so, you know, I enjoy the Fast and the Furious movies because I, I do. I mean, I, I watch them. They get more bloated and more, you know, insane by, by the movie. So those are not really characters, you know, they're tropes. And, it, you know, it's okay because maybe those movies don't need characters. Uh, I think that's, you know, that's a choice. I don't think that's an accident. You know, action movies in general, you don't need characters to be too deep. Right? They just need to be resilient and bleed and fight. <laughs> we go back to the graduate, Mrs. Robinson. Yeah. Was she, was she three-dimensional? Oh, definitely. De well, I mean, there is no movie without her, right? It's Benjamin and Mrs. Robinson. And, and this is what's interesting. When I first watched it, I think, in my, probably as a teenager, um, I don't think I understood her that well. As you get, you know, as you get older, you you get her predicament more clearly. It's like, oh, I, you know, I see where she is in life. I see why she feels unfulfilled. I see why she would flirt with this youngster. You know, um, it's such a complex character, and um, I feel like if you can get characters to do anything, and you can still understand their motivation and their contradictions and relate to them then that's, that to me is success. You talked about great openings. Have there been excellent films that had kind of weak openings? Or is that always a through line? Great films, great openings. You can't have one without the other. I'm, think, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. I know there are films that take their time to get there. Um, See, the thing is, I, those are the ones I forget. Great openings are memorable. Um, I always say that things you forget are because, not because you have a problem, maybe, or maybe you have a neurological problem, but mostly the things I forget is because they were not memorable. And what's memorable, memorable and what's not, that's another question. But I do know, um, the, you know, I, I do know which openings I, I remember every single time. And that's because they're great, you know. And I could say, for example, the opening of uh, Back to the Future, right? I remember that exactly. Why is it that, you know, that because that's a perfect script in its own genre, right? Same with Indiana Jones. I mean, I don't know, even The Exorcist. The great openings are, and I'm talking movies, I could talk TV as well, you know, Breaking Bad, I mean, all sorts of examples, but great openings are always memorable. Um, the reason I can't think of any negative examples is because I've forgotten bad. I mean, there's really, I mean, I have no need to archive that, you know, to, to save that in my, in my brain archive. Because the ones I've been over and over again uh, are the ones uh, that I take as examples.